If you're here watching this video, then you're interested in trading stocks. In this video, I'm gonna to touch on the main areas that you need to focus on to learn how to trade stocks on your own. It won't be hard, it won't be confusing, and by the end of this video, if you make it to the end, then you have a good chance of succeeding on your journey as a stock trader. So first, I'm just gonna to briefly touch on what day trading is and how it works. So stocks are made up of thousands or millions of shares, and each one of those shares represents a piece of a company. As day traders, we're trying to buy these shares at a specific price and then sell it at another price, either higher or lower, in order to make money. So it's different from investing because investors are trying to buy shares of a stock and hold it for years and years in order to make money. But as day traders, we're trying to buy it and sell it quick. It's very fast. So we're trying to buy shares and then sell it within a couple minutes or even a couple hours. But whatever the case, we're trying to buy the shares and sell them within that same day and make money that day. So in order to trade stocks, you're going to need a broker. A broker is just a middleman between you and the exchange. It's the place that you buy shares of the stock. So what you do is you open up a brokerage account. It's pretty much just like a bank account. You stick your money in there and then that's where you go ahead and buy the shares of the stock. It's actually pretty simple. You just go on there, tell them the stock ticker or the stock symbol that you want to buy, uh, the amount you want to pay for it and the amount of shares you want to buy and you execute the order through your broker. Now, I'm not going to go over specific brokers. I use interactive brokers. There's TradeStation, Robinhood's a broker, TD Ameritrade has a Thinkorswim. There's a lot of different brokers online. Just Google, do a Google search and find out what works best for you. But you're going to need a broker in order to trade stocks. In order to trade stocks, we need to be able to look at stock charts and read stock charts to be able to see what the stock is doing, the price of the stock, and other certain characteristics that are gonna help us trade them. Stock charts look a little bit confusing, but they're actually not that confusing. So there's three different types of stock charts that people primarily use. There's the line chart that you're looking at right here. There's the bar chart that you're seeing right here. And line charts and bar charts are really older charts that not many people use anymore. They're more of like the old school type of charts and they actually do not provide as much data as the next chart, which is the candlestick chart. This right here that you're looking at is a candlestick chart, and it tells us a lot more than the bar chart and the line chart. And it's also a lot more easy to analyze in a fast-paced environment, which is what we want. All right, so these right here are called candlesticks, and each candlestick can tell us a lot about what the price of a stock did. So if we take a look at this green candlestick on the left, this green portion right here is called the real body. And this represents where the price of the stock spent the most time. This little line right here is called the upper shadow or the upper wick. And this little lower shadow is called the lower shadow or the lower wick. On the red candle, it's the same thing. This is where the price spent most of the time. This is the upper shadow or the upper wick. And this is the lower shadow or the lower wick. Now on a green candle, this portion right here, this little flat part, represents the price that the stock opened. This flat part on the top represents the price where the stock closed. This high portion represents a high that the stock hit during that time, a high price. And this low portion represents the low price that the stock hit during that time. On a red candle, it's opposite. The open is right here at this flat part and the close, the, stock, the price the stock closed at is down here. So the open is up here on the green candle, so that means that the stock actually moved higher and closed higher. On the red candle, the stock opened here and actually moved and closed at a lower price. So right here, we can see some examples of how this worked. So right here on this candlestick, the stock opened at $19, moved lower and hit a low of $18.50, and then traded through this range, hit a high of $20.50, and then closed at $20. On this red candlestick, the stock opened right here at $20, hit a high of $20.50, moved lower and traded through this range, and then hit a low of $18.50, then closed at $19. So let's take a look at exactly how these candlesticks work. All right, so right here, we're looking at a candlestick. We're set on a five minute chart. That means that each one of these candlesticks represents what the price of the stock did within that five minute time frame. All right, so if we go to a one minute chart, now all these candlesticks each represent one minute. Okay, if we go to a three minute chart, 
Now, each one of these candlesticks represents what the price of the stock did within that three minutes, right? So let's go back to a five minute chart. Let's look at this red candle right here, okay? All right, so it says the stock opened at 241.21. Since it's a red candle, we know that the price actually went down during this candle. It actually declined. So 241.21, all right? We click right here. This little flat part, 241.21. That's where this price of this candlestick opened at. It closed at 239.68. Right here, 239.68. That's where that next flat part is. When this candle was moving, when it was forming, it hit a high of 241.89, which will be the top of this wick, and then it hit a low of 238.99. All right, so we can see that's what this candlestick right here did, this red candlestick. It opened up at 241.21, hit a high of 241.89, moved a lower, hit a low of 238.99, and then closed at 239.68. If we wanna look deeper inside this candle, since it's a five minute candle, we can go to a one minute chart, and now we can see what exactly happened inside that candle. So the stock opened up right here, moved lower quickly, Hit that high of 241.89, moved lower. You can see that the majority of the of the five minute candle, one, two, three minutes, was pretty much within this frame where that real body was. Then hit the low right here of this, this candle at 238.99, and then moved higher and closed right here at 239.68. All right, so that is what happened inside of that five minute candle. Let's look at it again. Here's the five minute candle. So these candlesticks give us an idea of what the actual price did during that selected time frame. So the way we view these candlesticks is by using stock charts. Right here, what you're looking at, this is a stock trading platform. It's called TC2000. This is what I use to view my stock charts. It actually costs money. There are free platforms, but this one costs money because it has a built-in scanner. We're gonna talk more about scanners a little bit later in the video, but basically a scanner is just a way to find stocks to trade and to keep track of them, all right? If you wanna use this type of platform, there's gonna be a link in the description and in the comments for $25 off your first month. If not, there's other ways that you can use stock charts that are free, and we'll take a look at some right now. So one of the most popular Free trading platforms is a platform called TradingView. You just go to tradingview.com and it's free for the most part. I think they have a paid version as well. But if you just want to look at stock charts and get started and follow along and start learning how to use technical analysis, you just come in here, type in the stock ticker, and then your charts pop up and you can go ahead and use those to follow along and start learning more without having to pay any money. That's the good thing about it. I think if you want to upgrade, you can. But for the most part, this is a good trading platform that people use that's free. Most brokers will have a free trading platform that you can use if you open a brokerage account. TradeStation has one as well. Interactive Brokers has one as well. So it's all personal preference. But if you don't want to open a brokerage account right now and you just want to look at stock charts, then TradingView is probably your best bet. We use these stock charts to analyze different characteristics of the stocks to find good prices to enter and exit so we can make money. Stocks tend to form patterns over time. And what happens is when these patterns are formed, they reoccur, they happen again and again and again. And by being able to visually analyze them and find these patterns, we can find places to enter the stock and then we can find places to exit and make money. So here's an example right here. This may not look like anything to you, but I'm seeing a pattern right here in front of us called a flag pattern. So if you look right here, this stock is trading sideways and it has this little, what's called a consolidation where the stock is trading within this tight range sideways. That right there forms your flag. And then this long spike with all these candles, these big green candles, this is your flag pull, all right? So together, this forms what's called a flag pattern. All right, because the pattern actually looks like a flag. This is called a bull flag. So if we were to use this pattern and we were to use this to enter the stock right here, when the price broke over the top of this flag pattern, let's say we entered here at 245.71. All right, we entered the stock 
in order to make a profit. We wanted to see if the price goes higher so that we can sell it at a higher price. So we entered right here when this flag was broken. And now let's see what the current price of the stock is. Right now, the current price is at 251.26, and it already has hit a high of 252.16 today. So if we would have entered right here at 245.71, when the price broke over the top of that flag, it actually moved up to 252.20 so far. So that's about a $6 profit, six to $7 profit right there if we would have exited around 252. And we would have entered because we saw this flag pattern right here. So that's a basic idea of what we're looking for. We're using these charts to look for different patterns or different areas to enter the stock and then different areas to exit. All right, this is just a very basic idea. There's a lot more characteristics that we can analyze as well. So in order to place trades, we also want to know about volume. Volume represents how many shares were traded during a specified amount of time. How many shares were changing hands during that time frame? So this is something we can add to our chart. It's called an indicator. This tells us how much volume was traded during that amount of time. Let's say we look at this red candle again right here. We can see that during this five minute candle that 123,000 shares were traded during this five minutes right here alone, okay? So that's what these volume bars tell you. These volume bars can tell you how many shares are being traded. That's important because if you get into a stock where there's not enough volume being traded or there's not enough shares being traded, then you have what's called a large spread. So if you look at the right of my chart, you can see these two little blue triangles. All right, one says 250.59 and one says 250.40 right now, all right? So the difference between 250.40 and 250.59 is 19 cents, all right? That's known as your spread. The stock market is an auction, and this right here is known as the asking price, the 250.54. The 250.36 that's displayed right now is your bid, all right? So this is your nearest buyer, this is what they're bidding, and this is your nearest seller, 250.54. So if you're trying to enter this stock at an exact number, let's say 250.45 right now, you may not be able to because your nearest buyer or seller may be far away. And a lot of that has to do with volume. If you look right now on a one minute chart, this last candle, this red candle right here, only had 3.7 thousand shares being traded, all right? If we go to a stock like Tesla and look at the same exact one minute candle, we can see that 444,000 shares were being traded right here. Okay, and look how much tighter the spread is. You can see that 216.33 is your ask and 216.32 is your bid. Now it's moving so fast right now and the reason it's moving fast is because there's a lot of people trading right now within this one minute candle. So this is a very active stock. There's a lot of volume. The reason that's important is because if you get into a stock, we want to try to get in at the exact price we want. All right. If there's not enough volume, it's likely that we won't get into the stock at the exact price that we want. So if we were to place a trade on Tesla right now at 216.44, we're almost guaranteed to get in at that amount. Now, if we were to go back to the stock we were just looking at, which is PANW, if we wanted to place a trade right here at 250.58, you can see there's almost no movement on this candle. What that means is that we may not be able to get in at 250.58. And although it is important where we get in, it's also very important that we're able to exit the stock at the right time. So when you have stocks like this with a lower amount of volume, or a less amount of shares being traded, it's harder to get in where you want or get out where you want. That's important because we can take bigger losses. So sometimes when you have these stocks like this, like right now, there's about a 30 cents difference between the spread. With the amount of shares that we're buying while we're day trading, it can be dangerous to trade lower volume stocks because let's say the stock is going against us. So we enter the stock trying to think that it's gonna go higher 
and then it starts going against us and we need to get out with a loss, a small loss, what will happen is the loss may end up being a lot bigger because we set the price for 250.51 to exit, but let's say it doesn't fill till down here around 250.28, all right, like a 30 cents difference. That may be a lot bigger loss than we want. So that's another indicator that we use on our charts to analyze is volume. Another thing that a lot of trading platforms have available is a section for like news and press releases. Uh, Thinkorswim, for example, has a section that is specifically for news that you can find out different news going on in the stock and that becomes helpful so you don't have to look other places. There's also a lot of other indicators that are available on your stock charts, things like Fibonacci retracements, stochastics, MACDs, RSI. And although these things can be helpful, they're not necessary to make money. What we're going to talk about next is the most important aspect of trading and making money. And that's the four keys to a setup. A setup is something that we use that allows us to enter or exit a trade, like a pattern. When I say enter a trade, I mean we enter into a position by buying or selling shares of that stock. There are four keys to a setup. Price pattern, which we've already talked about a little bit when we talked about the bull flag pattern. That's a pattern that price makes. Volume, which we've already touched on a little bit. Support and resistance. So once all four keys to the setup are present, price pattern, volume pattern, support and resistance, we will then have a good indication of where we can enter the stock and what to expect as far as profit targets and how much we can make. Right now, we're gonna talk about support and resistance. So what is support and resistance? Support and resistance are areas on the chart that stops the price from going in one direction. So support is viewed as like a floor. So whenever the stock price hits that floor, it tends to slow down and move in the opposite direction and be supported. A resistance can be viewed as like a ceiling. So whenever the price hits the ceiling, it reverses as well or it slows down before moving higher. It's like if you take a ball and throw it on the floor, the ball is going to bounce. If you throw it at the ceiling, the ball is going to bounce off the ceiling and come back lower. So if we take a look at TAL's chart, we can identify areas where the stock stopped moving lower and was supported. If you take a look right here, right here, right here, right here, we can take a look at that and we can see a floor forming, right? One, two, three, four different occasions, this same area stopped the stock from moving lower and the stock bounced off of that area and moved higher. Anytime the stock hits the area two or more times and is supported, then we can identify that as support. The more times the price of the stock hits this area and bounces off of that area, the more valid that level of support becomes. All right, now support and resistance can be slightly angled upwards or downwards, or they can be relatively flat. All right, and it is just an area on the chart. It's not often an exact number. If it looks like it's an exact number, like $100, let's just say we called $100 support. A lot of times you will see the price push through that area just a little bit before it bounces. So right here on this area, you can see that the price actually moved through that area and then bounced, whereas it tested that level again and then tested it here almost exactly all right now we can also see another level here and this is resistance you can see that the price of the stock tried to move higher right here and was rejected and moved back lower it was supported and then it moved back higher and in the same area it hit this area and it moved back lower then it tried to move back higher again and then right here in the same area it moved back lower and it tried one more time right here and it was again rejected all right, so together, these form support and resistance. So resistance is a ceiling, stops the price from moving higher, and support is a floor, stops the price from moving lower. Now these areas of support and resistance are very important because they can help us time entries into the stock and give us areas where we can actually buy the stock at the right time 
and hopefully get the move higher. Or if we're in a position, let's say we bought the stock down here in this around this area and we were trying to get the price higher, we know that when it approaches this area, it's likely that it's gonna reverse because it's resistance. And if we bought it down here, it's the same thing. We know if it gets back up there, it's gonna be resistance. Or it could be resistance, so we need to be prepared to either take some profits or sell our position entirely, unless we're trying to build a position by buying at these support areas in the hopes of this breaking. You can also see that within this larger area of support and resistance, there's smaller areas of resistance and support. If you take a look right here, you can see that this whole area, every time that price reached this area, it was getting rejected. And then you can see right here that every time it came to this area, it was being supported, right? So here was a, sh here was a small short-term area of support and resistance within the larger area of support resistance. And since this is only a five minute chart, if we were to go to a higher time frame, like a daily chart or an hourly chart, we are gonna see much, much more levels of support and resistance. Support and resistance are also important because as we see the price of this stock coiling up, getting tighter and tighter inside of a range, Often when it breaks to one side or the other, you're going to see a big move in that direction of the break. So you can see right here that this range starts off a little bit wider. When we hit the end of this range right here, it's a lot smaller. You see this, this is about 30 cents. And up here, this is about 60 cents. So it's almost double the size right here as it is right here. So we can say that the price of the stock is actually coiling up, getting tighter and tighter and tighter. It's like a pressure cooker. It's building up pressure, getting ready to break out. So if we see something like this consolidating, getting tighter and tighter and tighter, a lot of times it's not best to trade within these ranges, but instead wait and try to time the area of the break out so we can get the move higher. So what happens if we would have bought some shares at these levels right here of support in anticipation that this was going to break this range of resistance after it coiled up and got tight. Well, let's take a look what would have happened. You can see that when the resistance level was finally broken, you got this huge push after. This is called a breakout. A breakout occurs when a level of resistance is broken. So you can see that every time this area of resistance was tested by the price of the stock, it got rejected and moved back lower to support. But as it kept doing this, we got this consolidation with the price tightening up within that range. And when it finally broke that range of resistance, from all that pressure getting built up, it exploded higher. So we could have actually potentially entered this stock somewhere around here in anticipation of that breakout when we saw it was testing support again, or we could have even entered here near the resistance level when we saw that this price was probably going to break as this range got tighter. And let's say we would have entered either one, we would have had a big reward for our risk. So this is just one example of support and resistance. Let's take a look at some more. Okay, so let's take a look at this NVIDIA chart. This is a daily chart. Each one of these little candlesticks represents one day. All right, so if we look at this range right here, this consolidation, we can see that the price of this stock has just been moving sideways, building up this consolidation kind of in another range, okay? So what do we see when we look at this range or this consolidation here on NVIDIA? we see that the stock pivots at these major areas. Okay, now a pivot is just when the stock is moving in one direction and it turns. That turning point where it goes the opposite direction, like right here, this is a pivot. This is a pivot because the stock's moving in one direction and then it starts to move down in the other direction. Right here it moves up higher and then it starts to move lower again. So what we can see here is that we have a couple different points where NVIDIA hit resistance. 
right? So we can see right here it hit resistance, it hit resistance here again, and then right over here it tried to break over resistance, but then got rejected and fell again, okay? And then it was held up again, it was supported by some level. Now, why was it supported right here again and started to move off that level? Most likely because back here, this low pivot is the first spot that it bounced and moved higher off that level. So you can see right here, the price moved higher when it came back lower. This right here is where it stopped. Then it moved back higher, hit this pivot right here, consolidated, moved up higher, hit resistance again, and then it came back down to this area before moving higher. All right, so it came back down to that area because this right here was the last pivot that stopped before the price moved higher. So if we were to go ahead and draw a line right here, a support line, we can probably say that this is a valid level of support. The price has bounced off this area two times, and this is probably your resistance area, okay? So it's likely that these two areas are support and resistance and that this stock is just trading within this consolidation. So since this stock was already in an uptrend previously, we can see it was moving higher. A lot of times, most of the time, the stock is going to travel in the path of least resistance. So if we've seen that the stock is trending higher and moving higher, we are probably looking for a continuation of that move higher. So we're going to try to anticipate that this stock is going to move higher. So let's see what happens when it breaks resistance or support. All right, so we can say this was support, it held, this was resistance, the price moved back up into this area, looks like it's having trouble breaking over again. So you see whenever that zone was broken, Nvidia pulled back one more time right here to this area and then moved higher. Now, you can see that within this bigger zone, there was smaller zones of resistance and support, right? You had this right here, this area, support, and then you had this other little consolidation, resistance. So there were smaller zones of support and resistance within this larger zone. But this was the larger, more powerful zone, all right? And even when resistance was broken right here, you had this little nice move higher, but it failed to move back to the major level of support. So since Nvidia pushed higher out of this zone, then we can say that this is probably a pretty valid level of support, all right? So as we start moving higher, Nvidia keeps going, right? It broke this level of resistance, it broke through this consolidation, and now we have this resistance support zone right here. Nvidia moves higher and moves higher and moves higher, moves higher, and eventually a stock is going to move so high so far that it needs to retrace, right? What goes up must come down. When something moves too high, any stock, it's going to need to pull back to some sort of level, some sort of level of support or resistance. So finally you see Nvidia hit some sort of resistance up here. There was no other prior price history on NVIDIA at this point because if we look back as far as we can on the charts, NVIDIA had never reached a price that high yet. So for whatever reason, maybe because it got too overpriced, a lot of people were not willing to pay that price anymore, NVIDIA started to pull back lower, okay? Now, we have this level of resistance right here. And we can see that there's kind of like this smaller level of resistance right here. But this is but this is the major level of resistance now since it has been tested and price is starting to fall lower within that area. Okay? So the price moves back higher, hits this level, and starts to reverse and fall lower. Okay? If we are interested in buying this stock, we are looking for levels of support before we try to enter into a long position, okay? We don't wanna just buy this thing anywhere up here when it's at extreme highs. We wanna look for a level of support and resistance. Right now, we know that this consolidation was a good solid level of support and resistance because we saw it trading back and forth in this range for almost a year, okay? So this is our major level of support and resistance. 
this is your major floor and this was your major ceiling. Now a lot of times resistance will become support after it's broken too. And you can kind of see that right here. When the price finally broke over, you can see it finally broke over out of that support range. It pulled back to this resistance level, which became a level of support and then it moved higher. So this whole zone is likely to be a support area or a level of support because there was so much buying and selling going on in this area. Okay, so in the future, we're looking for Nvidia to try to pull back to this area to see what happens. So we continue to watch the price and see if we can get another level, maybe another test of this resistance area so we can confirm that this is resistance or we're looking for this level to get hit so we can confirm support. So Nvidia keeps moving higher looks like it tries to move higher here again right but we still have this little area of resistance right here and it tries to push higher but then it fails again all right keeps moving keeps moving keeps moving keeps declining keeps declining now we're approaching this zone that could just be this support zone okay we can pretty much classify this as a support zone at this point this whole area could act as support. And we can see right here, Nvidia tried to push higher again off that area. When it hit resistance, resistance becomes support. So since it had been supported there before, it's trying to be supported there again. The stock is trying to move higher off that area. But it fails, the move fails, comes lower, comes lower, comes lower. And now we're finally approaching this area again. We had that test over there, and then we had another test of support over here. So now, two times NVIDIA tested this area, then it bounced off. This was the last spot that it made the major move higher. And now let's see what it does when it approaches this area again. Looks like it barely pushes through, but it's trying to get supported. And then we look and we see now Nvidia is actually back to all time highs. And where did it bounce? It bounced at that previous level of support where that support resistance zone was. So this hopefully gives you an idea of how support and resistance levels work and how they can be powerful. Now we had other areas of support and resistance. Like right here, you can see that this stock tried to form a level of support you had a you had the first pivot right here it bounced off you had your second one so you could probably start drawing a line right here of support and you had this nice little move off but when you ran into this resistance zone from before then that's where you got the decline so many people would have probably tried to buy in this area right this is called a double bottom pattern A lot of people probably tried to buy in this area right here when support was tested and held the second time. But you have to remember when we're looking at support and resistance, you had this resistance right here where the stock could not push above that level. And so what happens is you have this area. We have to be aware of that if we were to buy there and we watch it. And as the price moves back lower underneath that resistance zone, then we can confirm that that zone is still resistance. Since this zone is still resistance, we can actually draw this line now from these two top pivots because this was tested again. And let's see if the resistance came into play again. And you can see when the stock approached this area, you had this little consolidation and it even failed here again. All right. So this area was still acting as some sort of resistance right here at this point off these two previous pivots. Pulled back to that previous level, which we said resistance becomes support. And this area right here, this line that was previous resistance, and we saw how the price reacted right here. It moved higher back into that resistance zone, which now should be support. And then it moved higher off that area. Well, now... When it broke back over that area again, it pulled back to that same area that acted as resistance before, which should be support. 
all right? So this whole entire zone that was previous support and resistance became a new support zone. And that was the same zone that when Nvidia pulled back off that big pullback, that ended up being the best spot to buy before the next big incline in price. All right, so had we waited patiently for that area to be tested, we could have bought down here somewhere in this zone, anywhere from around 109 to 140. And the risk, even if you use this whole zone as your risk, which is about $30, Nvidia actually moved another $360 off of that area. All right, so by using support and resistance, we can really help time our trades and also we can help exit at the right points or at least be aware of what's going on so that if we would have entered back here in this support zone, this minor support zone, we would have been aware that there was a resistance level right here in this area because before we had our line right here, all right? So we would have been aware that there was a resistance in this area so that if the price did end up failing and coming back, we could have got out of our trade at our entry point or we could have just minimized our loss because when this support zone was broken, we could have exited the trade for a small loss, either one. And then we could have waited for the actual pullback to the major support and resistance zone from previously where the stock broke out. Now this chart may be a little bit confusing looking because it's a daily chart, right? Each one of these bars represents one day. So a lot of times if you're looking for a longer term trade like that, we can go to a higher time frame like a weekly chart. Now each one of these bars, each one of these candlesticks represents one week. And if you look at this now, it looks a lot cleaner and a lot more easy to identify these levels, right? You can see this whole little consolidation right here. And then you can see where the price pulled back to that zone and then moved higher. And you could even say that this right here was also ended up becoming a support zone one, two, three, four times. And when the price bounced, it bounced at this same level and this level combined. So you had two different support levels to bounce off of. You can see that when the price coiled up right here, inside the support and resistance, right? It became tighter. Then you had your move higher. And then you had this other consolidation right here within this range. And then that's when you had your breakout higher, right? So you had a consolidation here and you had another consolidation right here. It was just a long term pullback. All right. So I think we've covered enough about support and resistance in this video. We could actually go on and on and on about support and resistance. I think if you want to learn more about it, the best thing you can do is study stock charts, find areas of support and resistance and see how price reacts to those areas. The main thing I wanted to cover in this section was the four keys to a setup and that's price pattern, volume pattern, support and resistance. And with those four things and those four things alone, you can learn to trade and make money. The next thing I want to cover are stock trends. I'm going to briefly cover trends. We'll go over trends on a couple different time frames and explain what trends are because trends are important to trading if you want to capture bigger profits and if you want to improve your trading results. So the way a stock trend works is that once a trend takes hold of a stock, it tends to move in the direction of the trend. So what that does for us is it gives us an advantage because when the stock's moving in the direction of the trend, we can use the price pullbacks as entries and just like support and resistance, we can try to time our exits as well. So what happens when a stock is uptrending? It's making a series of higher highs and higher lows. So it will actually move up and down in stair steps or waves. All right. And each high point that the stock makes will be higher than the previous one. And each low point will be higher than the previous one. So if a stock is in an uptrend, it's making higher highs and higher lows. Now a downtrend is the exact opposite. A downtrending stock will be making lower highs and lower lows. So you have lower lows and lower highs, right? Each time 
the stock pulls back, these highs do not break the previous high, right? Each time it pushes lower, these lows are lower than the previous low. Okay, so this is how a stock trend works. Stock's gonna move higher, all right? Eventually, it's going to pull back. When the price pulls back, it's gonna form this pivot right here. And that pivot is gonna be called the swing high. Eventually, if the stock is trending, it's going to start moving back higher. And when it breaks, the price of this high right here, where this white line is, when it breaks over that, this previous low pivot, the lowest point of the pullback, will now be considered the swing low. Eventually, if the stock's trending, it's gonna pull back again, then it's going to rally higher again. When it breaks this next swing high, then this low, the lowest point of this pullback, is going to be considered the new swing low. So you have the swing high, swing low, swing high, swing low. You notice how this swing low is lower than this swing low. This swing high is lower than this swing high. So what that means is it means that each new high point is higher than the previous and each new low pivot is higher than the previous pivot. So the stock is making higher highs and higher lows, which means it's in an uptrend. As long as the stock keeps making higher highs and higher lows, when it pulls back, then it will be considered in the uptrend. Once this pivot right here gets broken, this low pivot, that gives us an indication that the trend is changing. It's either no longer moving higher it may actually end up reversing and moving back lower. You may see the stock fail to make this next high, come back lower, break this previous swing low. Now the trend is negated. Sometimes you will see the stock quickly bounce back up and move back higher and break this high again. But we don't know for sure if that's going to happen. So when you're riding trends or trying to follow trends, this is the first indication that the trend is over. What will usually happen is the stock will try to move back higher, find this resistance right here because like we talked about before, support is resistance. This swing low was the prior support. It gets broken. The stock pushes back up into that area, finds resistance, and then moves back lower. And that's a lot of times how trends end. And then many times after that, your downtrend will start or form, right? You get the rally higher, then you'll get the rally lower. And then what happens is these become your swing highs and these become your swing lows. So what we'll do now is we'll look at some stock charts on different time frames, and we'll identify some trends so you can get a better idea of what they look like. So let's take a look at a trend on a one minute chart. The price moves higher. Looks like it makes this high right here, pulls back, kind of consolidates in this area before breaking right here. Now in order for us to consider this a new swing high on the break, the candle needs to close above the previous swing high. So the high of this swing high was 161.49. The close of this candle was 161.67. So it closed above the previous swing high. So now we can consider this a new swing high. We need to see a pullback and another break of the new swing high. So since this started pulling back right here, we can consider this the new swing high. We have the pullback. This is our new swing low. This was our old swing low. Now the price moves higher, consolidates again, which is a nice pullback. Once it breaks, we have our new swing high and our new swing low. Right here, the stock moved above the previous swing high. So now we consider this our new swing low. 
and you see how high the stock goes before pulling back. It moves a little bit higher and then it has a nice little consolidation pullback within this area and then breaks above that again. So we can consider this our new swing low, the lowest point of the pullback before the break of the high. Here's our highest point. All right, we have the break right here on this candle. Keep moving forward. All right, we're looking for the new swing high. We see right over here, the stock makes a high and has a nice little pullback and consolidation. So we can consider this the new swing high. Now we need to wait for the stock to make a new low point, a new swing low. And right here, we see this is the lowest point of the pullback. So we can mark this as our swing low. Price moves across and breaks and closes above on this candle. Now there's a tiny little pullback right here, but this isn't a deep enough pullback. It's a very small pullback. So to me, the stock is still trying to move higher and find the actual swing high. This is a deeper pullback right here, this area. And this is the highest high point before the pullback. So I would consider this the new swing high. Now this one's a little bit tricky because in order to classify a new swing high, technically you want to see the price of the stock close above the previous swing high. Now right here, the high of this candle is 165 exactly, okay? This candle looks like it almost breaks, it comes close, but the close of the candle is 164.88. Then right here, it gets close again, but the close of this candle is 164.98. We actually wanted to see it close above 165. Since 165 was the high right here, then this is still considered our swing high. Pretty much this whole area, all three of these, this area is our swing high, but we can say 165 is our swing high. So we still have this swing low right here. So this is still really considered our swing low. We could say this is our new swing low, but the price never broke above 165 on the pullback. So really this is still considered just a consolidation at this point, and this should still be our swing low. If it were me and I were trading this trend, I would still probably consider this a swing low. If I was actually trying to capture profits on this, on this short term trend, depending on where I entered or where I'm trying to exit, most likely, I'm going to place a new swing low right here for an exit point. So if this low point gets broken, I exit the trade. Now, sometimes that works in my favor. Sometimes it doesn't because the bottom of this little mark could get broken a little bit and this swing low may not get broken. So for now, this is tricky because you could put the swing low right here, but since the price didn't close above the previous swing high, it did break it periodically just for about two cents and just probably for a couple seconds. But since it didn't close above, we can't really classify that as a new swing low yet, this one. So we keep our swing low right here for now until we see a break and a close above 165. All right, we get a pullback and then right here, our swing low gets broken. This low point got broken as well, and that actually is where you see the big drop start happening. So if we would have considered this our swing low, we would have been safe this time, and we would have probably actually captured a little bit more profit because if we were using the trend to exit the trade, we could have exited right here when this was broken and captured around 50 cents more profit. The trouble with that is, is if the stock would have decided to move like this, break this swing low, and then continue to move higher and break this previous swing high, then we would have still been in the trade if our swing low was right here. So if we were actually using the trend to trade on this, and we were stopping out whenever the trend ended, we would have actually lost a little bit more money because we would have ended up getting stopped out right here instead of up here. But technically, this wasn't a new swing low yet because the price of the stock had not closed above the previous swing high, which was the high before this initial pullback right here. Now, if we take our pen tool, we draw a line from the highs and the lows. We can actually see that the stock was making higher highs and higher lows. Each one of these high pivots or these swing highs 
was higher than the previous and each one of the swing lows was higher than the previous low, right? So it's making higher highs and higher lows. Except for right here, these two highs were the same. And then you had this possible swing low. You can see right here when that broke, now the stock is making a lower low. If we went to the technical swing low right here, even still, now this, the trend has changed because your stock is making a lower low than this previous swing low, right? So it's no longer making higher highs and lows. Now it's making the same highs and lower lows, right? So you can start seeing the trend shift. So that's why trends are useful because we can use them as a way to enter stocks and try to capture big profits. And when the trend ends, we can actually try to exit the trend before we take a big loss, right? All right, so let's take a look at a downtrend. This is the SPY on a five minute chart. Downtrends are important too, because people can actually make money while stocks are moving lower by shorting the stock. A shorting is just the exact opposite of going long. It's selling at a high price and then buying back at a lower price. So let's just take a look at how we can identify this trend. So right here, you can see the stock makes a low. So we can call that our swing low, moves up higher, makes this high right here. Now that's our swing high, travels back lower right here, consolidate sideways for a while. This is our new swing low. This consolidation right here has like a double top, but you can see this right here is the highest peak. And since the stock moved sideways for such a long time, it was considered like a pullback a sideways move consolidation, we can consider this our new swing high. Stock continues to move lower, makes a new swing low right here, moves back higher, but cannot break this previous swing high, and then continues back lower and breaks that new swing low. So this is our new swing high right here. Stock continues to move lower, and then pivots right here and tries to start moving back higher. So we can consider this our new swing low. So that's an example of a downtrend. We're not gonna to get too much more into trends. I think you get the point right here for this section. We will talk more about trends later on in the future of the video when we're talking about different strategies. So there are over 9,000 stocks on the stock market. And we want to be trading certain stocks with certain characteristics. And it would be very, very time consuming to go through every single stock every single day. And that's where scanners come into play. A scanner can help us find certain stocks with certain characteristics. So if we want to go through stocks that only have a certain price range from maybe five to $10, we can use a scanner to pull up all the stocks within that price range. If we want to find stocks with over a certain amount of volume, like let's say we wanna find stocks that are trading on a high amount of volume, maybe 1 million shares or more a day. We can use the scanner to find those. We can even combine the two and find stocks that are in the five to $10 price range that are trading an average amount of shares of over 1 million shares each day. Scanners are very important. Now there's paid scanners and there's free scanners. The main free scanner that I use is called finviz.com. Finviz. All right, now this is a free stock screener, stock scanner that will help you find whatever kind of stocks you want. Now it's free, but I think they have a paid subscription that may let you scan in real time. I'm not for sure because I don't use Finviz as my main scanner, but I do use it occasionally if I want to look at information on a stock. Like let's just say we look up NVIDIA. We want to find some information about NVIDIA. We can look up the chart. We can see a lot of different analytical data about the stock. Like right here, we can see the market cap. We can see the float. We can see the volume, the average volume and things like that. We can see a bunch of news about the stock down here at the bottom and all kinds of other information. All right, if we want to go to the screener, now we can scan for certain types of stocks. So let's say we wanna find stocks that are over $5 and let's say we wanna have stocks with an average volume of over 1 million, okay? So now you can see this pulled up 1,349 stocks that are over $5 with an average volume of at least over 1 million shares, okay? Now what I use is TC2000. This is the scanner that I use and I can, 
filter all different kinds of prices, the exact price range, one to $2 or the exact amount of volume. And I can add a lot of different things to find different stocks. Now, why this is important is because just like we talked about earlier, when we talked about volume, we want to be trading stocks with a high amount of volume. If we're swing trading or day trading, for day trading, we want to be trading stocks with a very high amount of volume to get in and out at the exact prices that we want to. If we're swing trading, we don't need to be trading stocks with as high a volume, but we still want a decent amount of volume. Like we can't be trading stocks like this with an average volume of 1,000 shares a day, right? Uh, this stock only traded 900 shares on Friday, right? So with these type of low volume stocks, we won't be able to even buy the correct amount of shares that we want to, and we definitely will not be able to enter and exit the stock at the exact time or price we want, right? We might put an order in if we wanted to get in the stock at say $20, we could be waiting a couple days for our order to fill and us to be able to buy shares at $20. And even if we, let's say we've tried to buy a thousand shares, we might not be able to even get filled on a thousand shares. So we want to be trading stocks with a high volume. So let's take a look at the opposite of the spectrum. Let's look at Google. Google trades on average 23 million shares a day. All right, on Friday, it traded 37.4 million shares. So we know if we trade Google, we're gonna get in and out of the stock at whatever time we want, if it's a matter of seconds. If we place an order right then, it's gonna get filled. So let's say on Friday, we went to enter this stock over here at around 122.58. If we put an order in at 122.58 at this time right here, we were going to get filled immediately. There's no waiting, there's no being scared while the price goes against us and trying to get out and losing a bunch of money we get out immediately, right? So that's the important thing about scanners. We can track and locate the exact type of stocks that we want to trade. And if you are day trading, this is why it's important to have a live scanner. I don't know if Finviz is actually a live scanner on the paid version, but I know that TC2000 is a live scanner and most brokers have a live scanner. I don't know how good they are, but this is why I use a live scanner like TC2000 because what I can do is I can use like a real time scan. Okay, and what I can do is I can run that scan and I can come up with a bunch of stocks. Like look, I got 149 right now and I can find stocks that are moving on a decent amount of volume and that have a certain price percentage and I can run through this list and find stocks to trade, okay? so. Um, if you want to know one of my scans, the, the scan I use usually right at the open for at least like the first 20 minutes is a pretty basic scan. I like to see a lot of stocks on the list. What I'll do is I'll use between a price history of between four and one thousand dollars because that's the price that I like to trade. And I'll use a volume over one million shares volume. All right, because I personally want to trade stocks that have at least five hundred thousand shares in the first five minutes. And even more than that, even if it's a million shares in the first five minutes, I feel like the volume is something that I really like to trade is high volume stocks. All right, and then change percentage, usually over 1%. Now that just picks up a lot more stocks. If that's not enough, you can also change this price percentage to like 3%, you know, or more, right? And you can also narrow the price range down to if you just wanted to have a certain range of maybe, let's say, $30 for your high and then maybe $10. So what this is going to pull up is stocks that are currently trading with over 1 million shares in volume, a price percentage of a 1% increase and price between 10 and $30. All right. So if we take a look at these, all these stocks should be within 10 and $30 price range and all of them should have at least traded 1 million shares today. Okay. So that's a scan that I use if I didn't scan earlier and I maybe I missed the scan or maybe it's just nothing is coming up, I can't find any good stocks I wanna trade, after the market opens, I'll run this scan and that will pull up a lot of stocks I can use to day trade, okay? Because if I look and it has, it's five minutes after the open and I can see that the stock has, you know, two million shares or three million shares, five minutes after the open, the price is where I want it. It's got a good daily chart that I can go ahead and use that to trade, okay? So now that we know what a scanner is and what a scanner does, we need to talk about stocks and finding the right stocks to trade. Okay, so if you look at the bottom of this list right here, it says 10,563. 
So there's 10,563 stocks on this main list of mine. Okay, and out of those 10,563 stocks, there is absolutely no way we can keep track of all those stocks or even try to trade even a small fraction of them. So what we need to do is we need to find stocks that we want to trade and place them on something called a watch list. Now a watch list is just a list of stocks just like this, but much smaller. And what the watch list does is we create these lists of stocks that we're interested in trading, and then we put them on this list so that we don't lose track of them and we can easily trade them. So let me give you an example. Right here is my main list of all my stocks I'm watching. I used my scanner today to run a scan so I could find specific stocks that I wanted to trade. When I ran that scan, this was the first watch list that I came up with. It had 95 stocks on it. Okay, now there's other watch lists that I make too, but these were the stocks that I found using the pre-market activity today that interested me in trading. So I had 95 stocks on my total list. Then what I do is once I pull up those initial 95 stocks, I need to sort through those and find specific stocks that I want to trade. Now, even though I pulled up 95 stocks using my initial scan criteria, that doesn't mean that all the stocks that I pulled up on this list are going to be worth trading. Now, as you learn more and more about technical analysis, you have to figure out how to use that technical analysis in order to try to pinpoint the right stocks to trade. Now, the way I trade on an intraday chart and I'm day trading is first, I look at the daily chart so that each one of these bars right here represent one day. And I look at the price pattern, the volume pattern, support and resistance levels, and I try to find stocks that are going to possibly make a big move. I want to be trying to nail the stocks on the days that they make these large moves because there's much more opportunity for profit. So this RVPH has an average volume of around 172,000 shares. Now I would never trade this stock on a regular day. If I was looking through stocks to trade and I saw this stock, I wouldn't trade it because there's too low of average volume for me to be intraday trading it. But today I had it on my list and it was one of the 95 that I picked out before the market opened. And today RVPH is trading at 25.4 million shares and we still have a couple hours till the market closes. And you can see how big this day has been so far compared to the average day. If we look at the range on this stock today, so far this stock has moved about $1.60 today. And for a $3 stock, that's a pretty big move. You can see it's up 38% right now. And at one point it was up a lot more than that. Okay, and now look at this compared to all the other days. Look at how big this candle is compared to these other candles on a regular day when it has low volume, okay? So what I'm trying to do is go through these stocks and make a list of the ones that I think are the most interesting. Now out of all 95 stocks that I saw today on the pre-market scan that I ran, I came up with a total of 27 that somewhat interested me. So now I've narrowed down over 10,000 stocks into 27 stocks that I might possibly trade today. Okay, so now I put these on my list and I can watch these for opportunities to trade. And even some of these didn't have the best chart, the best daily chart, so I wasn't too concerned with trading them or watching them, but I had them on my list in case they did something specific that I wanted to see. So if we look at these stocks today, all of them so far besides one have had a volume over 1 million shares, okay? For the most part, all of these stocks have a good amount of volume, okay? And they've made pretty good moves too. If you look at this chart right here on Tesla, it's already moved $18, okay? So Tesla's already moved a whole range of $18 right here from this high down to this low. Um, this SOFI, this is a pretty big candle too. It is going down, but that doesn't matter to me if the stock goes up or down, because if it goes down, I can short it and make money going down, or I can buy it and go long. The main thing is that there's volume, which today 90.1 million shares of volume, and 
the range is huge compared to these days. Like look at the size of this candle and then look at the size of these candles over here. They're much smaller, right? So Amazon is another stock that I thought could move higher today. And it has a decent volume so far, not much more than an average, but it's always got a good amount of average volume. So I know Amazon is something I can always trade, but the chart is moving higher and it's still got a good size range. So, and not always are you gonna be 100% right. So the main thing is, is that we're creating these watch lists and now instead of focusing on 10,000 stocks, we've narrowed it down to around 27. So there's a couple times that I make watch lists, okay? And I use those watch lists to trade. So I make a watch list for swing trading. I actually have a few different watch lists for swing trading based on different criteria and different scans that I use. And I also have watch lists for day trading. This watch list you're looking at right here, this is based on pre-market data. And what pre-market data is, it's this data right here in this green box. This is all of the after hours and pre-market trading. So after the market closes, you can see that there's still some movement in the stock and the stock's being traded. And then before the actual market opens, people can trade too as well, and that's called pre-market. And that's right here from this 5 a.m. forward. And I use this data to run a scan and find those stocks to make that initial list. Then I go through the stocks and try to find stocks with good daily charts that I think are gonna give me a good opportunity to trade during the day. Once I find them, I put them on this list and then I start watching during the market open for opportunities to trade these things. Another time I scan is aftermarket. So a lot of times what I'll do is I'll run an aftermarket scan to find stocks that have moved during the day. And so I'll have my watch list of the pre-market stocks that I'm watching, and I'll also have a watch list of stocks based on this scan that I've done right here, the aftermarket scan, and then I have also separate scans because I like to go and scan through the sectors and I make a watch list for my swing watch list and sometimes those will pop up as good charts to day trade and so I'll have those as well. The whole point of watch lists are is that we create lists of stocks that we want to keep track of, okay? And then tomorrow, if I have a watch list that's like a daily watch list, let's say that I come here tomorrow and I see that GTLS, like it doesn't today, it does not fit any type of criteria of anything that I would want to trade. It's just, this is called an inside day when this candlestick opens up in the prior day's range. And this is not something that I like to trade. So tomorrow, what I'll do is if this is on my watch list, I will just remove this from my watch list. If something else no longer fits the bill like TOP, I'll remove that as well. And slowly every day, I will develop like a main watch list of stocks that I wanna watch the next day or in the meantime, like if I'm swing trading, it could be in the next couple of weeks and I will slowly just add these or remove them as I see fit. So that's the importance of watch lists and that's how we keep track of stocks and we find out what to trade in a market with over 10,000 stocks available to trade. Now that we know what scanners are and we know what watch lists are and how to find stocks to trade, we need to talk about how we're going to trade these stocks. When I talk about trading stocks, I like to use the analogy of fighting, all right? If you're going to fight somebody, there is a multitude of martial arts you could use. You could use karate, you could use kickboxing, you could use wrestling, you could use taekwondo, and all of these different types of martial arts are just different ways of fighting or defending yourself. And trading is the same. There is a multitude of strategies. And even within those strategies, there's multiple different styles that people use in order to make money in the stock market. There is no right or wrong, there is no better style, but there is styles that may fit your personality better than somebody else's personality. And what we wanna do when trading is figure out which style fits our personality the best and which works for us the best, and that's what we use to trade stocks and make money. Today I'm gonna to talk about three different styles of trading that are very common and that I like to use myself and that work to make money. The first one we're gonna talk about is just a basic strategy of finding a pattern within a stock and using a static target for profits. What I mean by static target is that you are risking a certain amount to get a certain amount of reward and when that reward or that profit target is hit, then you get out of the trade. The way that we make money in stocks is to make more profits than we lose. 
that does not necessarily mean that we win more often, like have a higher winning percentage, 60 or 70 or 80 or 90% of the time. It's more so the fact that we get more off of our wins than we lose, right? That's a very common strategy. So let me give you an example here. When we're trading stocks, we want to have something called a stop loss, okay? A stop loss is actually a spot where we exit the trade if the trade goes against us and we lose a certain amount of money. So on every trade we take, we are accepting the fact that we may lose and we have to set a certain amount that we're going to lose. So in this example, let's just use $100 as our loss, which means that if we lose this trade, we are going to lose $100. So right here, this is called a three bar play. And this three bar play is a common pattern that occurs in the stock market over and over again. Today it occurred in AMD. So let's say that we wanted to trade AMD. When this candle right here broke the high of this very first candle, we enter the stock at 101.83. So before we enter the trade, we need to have a price that we're gonna exit the stock if the trade does not go in our favor and it goes against us so we can avoid having a huge loss, which is our stop loss. So let's say that we place our stop underneath this candle, which is a price of 127 cents. Now the difference between 101.83 and 127 is a dollar 56. So this red box right here is going to represent our stop loss. Okay, so we entered at 101.83, and if the stock goes against us until it hits 127 cents, we're going to exit, and we're gonna lose $100. If we want to profit on this and use a static target as a profit target, what we're going to do is we're going to want to get at least two times the amount that we're risking. So if we wanna exit this at a two to one win ratio, which is two times $1.56, which is equal to $3.12, we will want to exit at 104.95. This green box right here represents $3.12, which is our two to one profit target. So if we enter right here at 101.83 and our stop loss is $1.56 at 127 cents, then we're looking for a two to one profit target of 104.95, which is $3.12. This green box represents $3.12. And if we win on this trade, we stand to win $200. And if we lose, we stand to lose 100, which means we're getting two times the reward, right? Two to one profit target. When using static targets as a strategy, you guarantee that your reward is always greater than your risk. And it helps you because you don't have to think about anything else except for where to exit the trade if it goes for you and where to exit the trade if it goes against you. It is a very simple strategy and you can actually make money if you only win 50% of the time. So if we take a look at how a two to one win ratio works, if you were to take 10 trades, for example, and you had five wins and five losses, Five wins would net you $1,000, while five losses would be negative $500. You would come out with a total of $500 profit. Many people use static profit targets because of the mental benefits the strategy offers. You figure out how many shares you need, you figure out your entry, you figure out your stop loss price, you enter the trade and you let the trade play out. If it hits your stop, you exit with a loss. If it hits your target, you exit with a win. You could also extend this to three to one profit target and you would make more money. So if we look at this current trade that we would have taken off this three bar play, our three to one win ratio is at 106.51, which is a total of 468 after we entered. And so if we figure that out, right here, 106.51, this is your third profit target. So this would have actually been a three to one win ratio if we would have entered right here. And then you would have actually made $300 on this trade while you're only risking $100. So just looking for price patterns and then utilizing a static profit target strategy works very, very well, especially because you only have to win 50% of the time or even less to turn a decent profit. So the next strategy I wanna talk about is called scalping. 
Scalping is when traders are trying to capitalize on very small movements in price and they're not looking for huge static targets like we were just talking about previously. These are very, very fast trades, sometimes within seconds or minutes, and they're seeking to make multiple trades per trading session. So they're not looking for one or two big trades. They're looking to take maybe five to maybe even 20 trades or more in the trading session, very small trades and trying to take out very small increments. And over time with those multiple small profits, they'll make a good amount of money. Scalpers want to have a higher winning percentage because their wins are so small that they need a lot of wins to eliminate their losses, which may be bigger and less frequent. So an example of a scalp would be if we're looking at the same chart we were previously looking at when we were talking about the static targets, this three bar play right here. Now this is a five minute chart and this range in price seems pretty small. It's just actually three candles. But if we go on to like a one minute chart and we look at that same little pullback in price, right? We can see that right here, this was a high of 101.83 and this was a low of 127 cents. Now that is a total of $1.56. And so a scalper has a lot more opportunities because they're usually trading smaller charts like these one minute charts and possibly even smaller, maybe even 30 second charts. And if you look at the fluctuations in price, there's a lot of ups and downs, right? And so you have a lot more opportunities to make small trades and make money. So most scalpers are just looking for quick in and out moves, just trying to capture a small fraction of the price. They're looking for areas of the stock to maybe hit a resistance or show some sort of reversal signal candle or some kind of signal that they're going to buy or sell, and then they will sell or buy based on that signal they see, trying to capture a small profit. Some scalpers are looking for static targets as well, maybe 0.4 to 0.8% of their profit targets. So instead of looking for a two to one risk reward, they may be looking at a 0.8 to one risk reward or a 0.6 to one risk reward, okay? Let's say right here, they see this kind of inverted hammer at resistance, all right? Let's say that that gives them the signal that they want to short. So let's say they enter this trade short. That means they're betting on the stock to go down. They actually want it to go down so they can make money on the decline. They enter at 101.38. They place their stop 1% higher at 102.39, this purple line right here. And their profit target is 0.6% away at 177 cents right here, okay? So they would have actually entered this trade on this doji candle after they saw this inverted hammer reversal signal hitting resistance. And then on this second candle, one minute or maybe even less than one minute after they entered, they would have already hit their profit target and got out of the trade. And if the stock would have actually moved back against them immediately and came up here, they would have exited right here. Now, had they exited, they would have lost $100. When they won, they won $60. And so you can see it's the opposite of the two to one strategy. Each one of their wins is $60. And since each one of their wins is $60, they have to win more frequently because it will actually take two wins at least to eliminate one loss. And a lot of times a scalper may not use 1%, but that's just an example. Like I said, that could be 0.6, that could be 0.8, that could be one to one. The profit targets, it all depends on who the scalper is and what their strategy entails. But a scalper strategy is to win more frequently and make smaller trades within these small price fluctuations. A big benefit of being a scalper is that you're not in the trade for a very long time. It's very fast paced. So if you win a few trades in a row, you can actually call it a day if you want and you can make profits fast. And another advantage is that you don't have that time to really think much about the trade. Many times people trying to hold to a two to one profit target or bigger, it gets hard because your emotions start coming into play. When you see the stock moving for you and then start coming back, right? So once you start getting a profit and then the stock starts declining, 
a lot of times people have trouble really holding on to that trade because of their emotions and they end up exiting before their profit targets are hit. Scalpers, on the other hand, they have a lot more opportunities because the price fluctuations are so small, their profit targets are small, and they're going in and out of the stock so fast that they don't have a lot of time to really think about it and second guess themselves. So scalping is a different type of strategy, but it's also a good strategy, and it's a good strategy in, in choppy markets where there may not be a big trend like this. Like for example, this chart on REZI, it's not a big trending stock. So if you were to enter this trying to hit like a trend and get the move higher, like let's say you entered right here, thinking that you were gonna get this move higher, if the move never comes, well then a lot of times you just get stopped out or you sit in the trade all day while the stock moves back and forth. And now you're in this trade caught up and your emotions are going crazy and a lot of times you're gonna get yourself out with a small loss or you're gonna sit there all day wondering what's gonna happen and then you finally take a loss or nothing happens, you don't get any profit. A scalper on the other hand may have entered this trade right here on a smaller time frame, and already been out of the trade somewhere up here or maybe even lower on like a one minute chart. So scalping is just a very fast paced type of trading. The advantages are that you don't have to be in a trade long. You can actually take a lot of small profits fast. The disadvantages are that you have to have a higher winning percentage. So you really have to know technical analysis. You have to be very quick with your calculations and entering and exiting trades. And you have to know where to do it because if not, and your winning percentage is too low, you stand to lose a lot more than you actually win. The third strategy I wanna talk about is trends. We talked about trends a little bit earlier in the video, but now I wanna talk about how somebody would trade a trend and why it's so beneficial. When we trade trends, we are trying to enter into a trend and capture as much of that trend as possible and use the trend as a way to capture much bigger profits. So let me give you an example of how a trend trade would work. The first thing we would do is identify the trend and identify which way we want to enter the trade. Now, if we look right here, we can see this stock consolidated right here and made a low, kind of moved higher, came lower, made a higher low right here, then pushed back higher and made a higher high off of this level right here. So this short term trend is up. So what we want to do is find somewhere to enter the trend. So we wait for the stock to pull back and form a low that's higher than this low and higher than this low. And then let's say that we want to enter on the next break of this high right here so that we're entering on the new swing high and then we're gonna try to ride the trend. So what we need to do is we need to see a break of this red line right here, this resistance and a hold over. So the stock consolidates here, it makes the higher low. You got a low here, a higher low, higher low. So let's say we enter the trade right here on this candle. When it broke and closed above this previous swing high. When it breaks over, we need somewhere to place our stop. So let's say we place our stop down here underneath this swing low, okay? This candle closed at 349.62. So let's just say we entered the stock at 349.62. All right, the low of this doji candle right here, or the, the low of this low actually, is the lowest point of this higher low. So this swing low is 347.96. Let's say we put our stop at 347.95. So we want to place our stop 347.95 underneath this candle right here since that's the lowest point of this swing low. All right, and now what we wanna do is we wanna observe the trend until it either breaks this low or until it makes another higher low and breaks that higher low because that's where we think that the trend may be ending. So if we follow this trend all the way up, we need to try to lock in a profit. Let's see what we can get. All right, so if we're following the rules of the trend, we don't exit until a candle closes under the previous swing low. You can see right here, this was a swing low because you had the swing high right here 
and you had the pullback, and then you had the push higher, which broke this swing high right here, and then you had another pullback off of that swing high, which made another swing low. The bottom of this swing low broke the price of this swing low, but very quickly, and the candle did not close underneath. So that doesn't signal an end of the trend, okay? If this would have broken underneath and closed lower than this swing low, then that would have signaled an exit right here at this price, okay? But it didn't, and it kept going. So we can say that the difference between 349.62 and 347.95 is 167. All right? So that's how much we were risking, $1.67. Because we entered right here at this green arrow and had it broken this low, this was our stop price. So that was a total of $1.67, okay? We entered at 349.62. The current price, the high that it's made so far is 357.53. All right, so here's the high, 357.53. We're still in the trade. The difference between 357.53 and 349.62 is 7.91. All right, and 7.91 divided by $1.67 gives us a win ratio of 4.7 to one. That means if we would have bought enough shares that if we actually exited right here, we lost $100, we already are up $470. So since we're up $470 on the trade, that's a pretty big win ratio. Okay, so you can see the power of a trend if we can capture this trend and it's still going. The stock has still not pulled back and made a new swing low and then broken that swing low. So it could still pull back somewhere down here and then push higher and then break that new swing low, but it still hasn't. So let's just say that this arrow would have been our profit target had this closed underneath. The low of that swing low is 352.73. All right, and now the possible profit on this, the difference between 352.73 and our entry at 349.62 is 311. That gives us a win ratio of 1.8 to one, which means if this swing low had broken and closed below this swing low, we would have got a win ratio of 1.8 to one, which means we would have profited $180 compared to our risk of $100, okay? But there's also another benefit of trading these type of trends is that as the stock keeps on moving higher, we keep moving our stops up. And every time we move our stops up higher, Whenever this makes a new swing high, we lower our risk and lower our risk and lower our risk. Also, many people may choose to take profits at these levels, at least maybe take half their shares off. When the stock pulls back and we know that a new low has been made, a new swing low, they can reload their shares and buy back their original shares, which actually allows you to capture some profit on the trade and then continue to stay in the trend. Since if you do it at the right spot, your new stop could be under the previous low still, so now it's a risk-free trade with the possibility of getting a larger target. The benefits, if you're able to hold on to the trade and follow the rules of the trend, allow you to capture a much bigger profit, sometimes a 10 or 20 to one win ratio. Congratulations. You are one of the two to 5% of people who have actually made it to the end of this video which drastically increases your odds at becoming a successful trader. The truth is that most people that don't make it in trading are people that don't want to work towards the end result. They want something easy and fast and they don't wanna put in the work, which is why most people won't actually make it to the end of this video. I would like to tell you that everything you saw in this video is all you need to know about trading, but this is just one small aspect of trading. You've learned the basics, and now there is still a lot more to learn and a lot of experience that has to happen for you to be able to be successful and be consistent at taking profits home while trading. The fact that you've made it to the end of this video lets me know that you are serious about trading and I believe that you deserve a reward for that. For the next four days, I'm going to be offering a huge discount 
and a lifetime membership to my trading course. The link will be in the description below. There's also going to be a link to my free email newsletter that I send out a couple times a month, which includes trade breakdowns of trades that I've taken recently, why they worked, why they didn't work, along with other trade secrets and tips and tricks for you to succeed in your trading journey. I really hope this video helped you and I sincerely wish you the best on your journey. See you in the next video.